I watch a lot of YouTube. Like, a lot of YouTube. Like, a disturbing amount of YouTube. Send me help. Due to this slight addiction, you'll probably not be surprised to hear that I've seen a lot of YouTube exclusive series. This includes that amazing Papers, Please live action fan film, and that surprisingly good Payday 2 web series. And, of course, the subject of today's video, if you read the title, and if you didn't read the title, oi! Shape up. Wake up. Right now that, they're awake. Including the subject of today's video, Murder Drones. Now, Murder Drones is simply incredible. It's done by a team known as Glitch Productions, and I remember when a friend of mine first introduced me to the series, they actually told me that Glitch is made up of people from Element Animation. If any of you are old enough to remember that, I salute you. You're simply incredible. You're a Minecraft OG along with myself. How they went from Minecraft animations about villagers and giant creepers to animating thick robots and body horror, I literally have no idea, but you know, to each to their own. Seeing as these guys already have the excellent element animation on their resumes, you probably will not be surprised to know that this series is absolutely amazing. The story is, well, utterly fucked at moments, but season one is still in production whilst I write this, so I'm pretty sure that it'll all get cleaned up by the time I finish this damn thing. The animation is fluid and detailed, and this series looks absolutely amazing amazing graphically speaking. If I'm being honest, the series reminds me a lot of Death Stranding. Hostile, strange story, and it takes up all your computer's resources to render one scene. Due to all of these factors, I've pretty much binged watched all six episodes and decided to make this dumbass video about it because I like views, recognition, and expressing my opinion on stuff. So sit down, shut up, and I'm gonna talk to you about this series and why it's a masterpiece. Cue the video, bitches! So episode 1 starts off with some exposition, with a voiceover from a mysterious voice. They explain that they are worker drones, robots that were sent to help humans mine exoplanet for minerals and shit. You know, classic Wayland yutani type stuff. During this expedition, the humans managed to somehow destabilise the planet's fucking molten core, and turn a class M planet into reactor number 4. Basically meaning, they're all dead now. Yeah, if you can tell by the frozen skeleton. The destabilisation of the core has resulted in the entire planet becoming Moscow from the Metro games, and being plunged into nuclear winter. This left the worker drones alone to pretty much do their own thing, leaving them to, you know, make robo-babies. Wait, what the fuck? Unfortunately, Wayland yutanis board of idiots decided that leaving a rogue AI on a planet light years away from Earth and they can't harm humans in any way isn't such a good idea, and the board members, who were probably so stoned off their tits that simple sentences became a chore, said, DIVERT ALL FUNDING INTO MAKING MURDER robots. So that's what they did, making these things called murder drones with one sole purpose. Yeah, that. After some carnage, the footage zooms out into a slideshow presented by our main protagonist, Uzi. Okay, so just quick intermission. For the rest of the video, every time a new main character is introduced, I'm gonna do a little profile for them. So, this right here is Uzi. Utterly sadistic, talented engineer, Solid Snake's level stealth agent, cute yet scares me at the same time. Now that's out of the way. So the footage zooms out into a slideshow presented by Uzi with stock images that she didn't remove the background on. I mean, at least they're animated, I suppose, but... Yeah. and a fucking <laughs> click to add title slide. <laughs> She states that their parents have done nothing but build doors to protect them from the murder drones whilst they build a tower of corpses outside. Which, if I was in this situation, with a nice big door, a loving family, and a nice place to live, I wouldn't really complain, but, you know, to each to their own. Due to all of these factors, Uzi's school project is, quote, This is why my project is this sick as hell railgun! This is what I meant when I said talented engineer. After getting the shit ripped out of her by her teacher, the railgun... Yep, can't say I didn't see that one coming. And also, by the way, this isn't a rail gun. It's a laser gun. It's pretty much the ray gun from COD Zombies. Rail guns fire metal projectiles using electromagnets. Just saying. After a quick trip to the nurse's office, wait, why do they need a nurse's office? Uzi decides to wake up at 3am to record a clickbait YouTube video. Okay, JK, JK, she doesn't actually do that. Leave me alone. She wakes up at 3am to sneak out and find a replacement power source for that laser gun that does... Yeah, that. Oh, and by the way, it was only when I was re-watching the pilot episode for this video that I noticed this picture on a shelf in Uzi's dad's room of him holding baby Uzi. Now, when I noticed this photo, it immediately made me raise so many questions. Like I said, the photo depicts Khan, Uzi 
Uzi's dad holding Uzi with some kind of dark mess of limbs and yellow stuff oozing out directly next to him. Right in the image, we can see a clear view of a hand reaching out from the dark pile to help hold baby Uzi. Is this Uzi's mother? This is highly likely as Khan is standing directly next to it and seems completely nonplussed by the fact that a grotesque flesh monster is reaching for his child. And the fact that the figure is oozing yellow liquid links it to the murder drones who will be introduced to in a second, as they have yellow nanite acid in their tails. This immediately links Uzi and Khan with the murder drones. Also, quick ripe, why would you leave a disc with Master Door Key written on it in a peg in your room? completely unguarded. Seems like a massive security oversight, but I digress. Uzi steals the key and is about to sneak out when she runs into her dad, Khan. Okay, so quick note about Khan. He works for the WDF or Worker Defense Force, builds massive doors to keep out the murder drones and is a massive pussy. After bullshitting her father, dick move by the way, Uzi finally gets out and heads to the murder drone lair to look for a new power source for her laser gun. Not a fucking rail gun, for God's sake. On the way there, she steps on a robot corpse. Now, if I saw that, I'd run in the opposite direction. Making it to the murder drone's lair, she finds the power source she's looking for, but at a cost. A murder drone just happens to arrive right at the wrong moment. The way they introduce the murder drones is just, oh my god, just you got to see this for yourself. I just love the way they did this. Due to the face visor being completely black, you think you're looking at the back of the drone's head, and then the eyes activate and you realise it's been staring directly at you the entire time. And the moment before it attacks is just so creepy and so well done. Reminds me a lot of when the Xenomorph is first introduced with Alien, with the sweeping score slowly building up to when it attacks. Just amazing. Uzi quickly attaches the new power supply, making the gun look like the Covenant Carbine from Halo 2 Anniversary, but doesn't get the chance to use it as apparently Murder Drone's landing causes miniature earthquakes. Uzi gets sent flying, but lands perfectly and says, Whoa, and they said pirating all that anime was useless. <laughs> ah yes, a fellow pirate. The drone manages to stick Uzi with the nanite acid, burning a hole through her hand, which kind of reminds me of the Xenomorph from Alien with the molecular acid that it has for blood that can just burn through everything. It throws her and also takes ages to turn around, allowing Uzi to grab the Covenant Carbine. Also, I love how when the drone is looking for a target, it sees Uzi but doesn't fire as a targeting reticle says, plot armor detected. It's just hilarious. She says, and fires it. Not a railgun. The Covenant Carbine freaking decapitates the murder drone. Although the victory is short lived, as the drone regrows its freaking head. Oh dear. Uzi grabs a disembodied arm and uses it as a melee weapon as the Covenant Carbine needs to recharge. She hits the drone and causes it to reboot without its ocular systems functioning correctly. And this is where we are introduced to serial designation N, or N for short. Certified simp, massive masochist, definitely a sub, likes it when women step on him. Lovable dork. I mean, just look at his goover, he's great. After some conversation, N sees that Uzi has a hole in her hand and reveals that the murder drone saliva can neutralize the nanite acid, which prompts this scene. Sweet, uh, <laughs> I'm open to new things, I guess. We are never talking about this. Talking about what? <laughs> Consider it, uh, repressed. N reveals there are three murder drones on the planet, himself, V, and J. So V is... No! Thing. Utterly unhinged. Wife material, unfeeling sadist. Do not go near her in a dark alley unless you have a death wish. And also N has a crush on her. And J N, you're worthless and terrible. Thank and you. if the company allowed it, I would straight up kill you myself. Yep, definitely a Dom. Hates N. Massive bitch. Where is my BFG 9000? It was revealed that the drop pod they are in is a spaceship. Although N states is more of a one-use missile as the company. Wipe shit, wrong logo. Yeah that company, never taught them how to land. It's also revealed that the murder drones need to ingest oil in order to survive. To be honest, these drones just seem way too human to me. Like, they have saliva and need hydration to survive. God damn it, Wayland, you tiny clone. You couldn't make normal androids for once. Uzi manages to stir something in N as she states that the company will probably just dispose of them once all the worker drones are dead, but her speech is cut short by both V and J arriving at the same time. Uzi just Usain bolts that shit whilst J gives N a little slap, prompting him to realise that Uzi 
Uzi was a worker drone all along. Also, I like for a few frames on N's death screen that you actually see a reference to the absolute solver. This episode is just full of foreshadowing for events that will happen in future episodes, and I absolutely love it. N realizes that he's been a twat and gives chase after Uzi, following her back to the worker drone base. Uzi tries to close the door, but... To be honest, the murder drones do really remind me of the Xenomorph from Alien. They can use their tails just like the Xenomorphs can, you know, with like sticking people. Anyway, N politely lets himself in and for lack of a better term, starts going ham. You know what, I'm just going to show you the whole scene, but overlay with BFG Division music so I don't get copyright claimed. Please don't copyright claim me glitch, I need the watch time. This song is content matched. This song is content matched. This song is absolutely 100% content matched. I'm talking over this shit because quite frankly, I don't want to get sued. Please don't sue me Bethesda. Khan sees that Uzi let a murder drone in, and Uzi is so busy arguing with him that she forgets to shoot the massive murderous robot in front of her. Like, can we open up later please? Can we talk about emotions at some point other than right now? No? Okay then, carry on! So Uzi forgets to shoot, prompting this scene that I used in the intro because it's absolutely awesome. Khan doesn't shoot the murder drone, pinning his daughter against the wall because he's a massive pussy and leaves her for dead. N has this change of heart and doesn't kill Uzi. Like I said, plot armor thicker than a Call of Duty protagonist. Not soap though, rest in peace. Buddy. V and J enter the building. V immediately leaves to go kill more murder drones, and we're just left with N and J. N questions why they need to kill the worker drones, as he realizes that they aren't dissimilar from themselves, prompting J to place a corruption device on him. I told her she was a bitch. Uzi rescues N from certain death, and a fight between V, J, and Uzi ensues. Uzi pretty much just kicks the shit out of J and blasts over the Covenant carbine, while N. <laughs> Yep, told you it was a masochist. Jay manages to get the upper hand and makes the classic movie villain blunder where she starts monologuing. This prompts Uzi to stick Jay with her own tail and then blast her in the face. Was that line weird? Nah, yeah, probably not. After fighting with Adath some more, Uzi exiles herself. Sitting and watching a sunrise, Uzi has some important character development, saying she wants to kill all humans. Who are you, Bender from Future Armor or something? And we get this scene that I also used in the intro, twice, of Uzi temporarily turning yellow, further proving her link between her and the murder drones. The camera pans out to show the planet, and with that, the episode ends. Now, episode one is the perfect setup for the series. The episode raises so many questions that will be answered in subsequent episodes. We are introduced to many main characters that will persist throughout the series. And the way that the murder drones is introduced is pretty much perfect, showing how they are these indestructible forces of nature that are definitely a force to be reckoned with. Kind of like the Terminator, but a hydraulic press won't kill them. As we go further into the series, it will start to lean more and more into the sci-fi horror aspect of things, if that wasn't, you know, immediately obvious. <laughs> with more and more getting revealed about both Uzi and the murder drones, learning about their past and where they came from. So without further ado, let's go straight into episode two, shall we? Episode 2 starts with some of N's backstory. Up until this point, we've had absolutely no idea where N is from. So it turns out that N was some sort of butler in this creepy as fuck house that reminds me a little bit too much of the Baker residence from Resident Evil 7. Let's just hope the drywall isn't as fragile. <laughs> this guy, who I assume is the guy who owns this creepy ass house with fragile drywall and angry licorice monsters, comments on the fact that someone found hair to play dress up with the robots, before tossing a glass to N who manages to land that shit perfectly before rushing off to clean them. On the way, he pumps into this robot with glasses, who I can only assume is V. The hairstyle and facial shape is very similar, you see. And it turns out that Jay is there also, and, well... <laughs> Move it, moron. Yep, she's as much of a bitch as a kid as she is as an adult. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Do the robots grow up like humans? Oh my god, JC, can you actually sort yourselves out? You're making the working Joe from Alien Isolation look tame. We are introduced to a character called Tessa, her being this shadowy figure like all the other humans in this scene. The scene ends with a new robot getting introduced, and the sight of this robot causes N to panic and the memory to glitch out and cut to black. With this one scene, so much is revealed, but yet nothing is revealed at the same time. So, 
we know that V, J, and N weren't always disassembly drones. They were had like a juvenile phase at some point, and they were servants of some kind. We know that they had a relationship, or at least knew each other, way before the events of the series take place. You'll probably wonder why I said nothing is revealed at the same time, 70 words ago. Well, as well as revealing J, V, and N's past, we also need to ask who the hell are the shadowy figures in this scene? Why does the sight of this one robot cause N distress and the memory to glitch out like you're playing Cyberpunk on day one? This section lasts for a minute and 20 seconds, but it raises so many more questions to add to the pile. N wakes up, so it turns out the memory that he was having was a bad dream of some kind, and it also turns out that the murder drones sleep upside down like bats do. I mean, not important, I just thought it was cool. N falls, and we get this scene of him looking at his hand, almost as if he doesn't recognise himself. Inside the drop pop, the glitch that we saw at the end of episode 1 is starting to take hold of Uzi, causing her to accidentally break a mirror. V is just over here blowing bubbles, and comments on the fact that the new power is weird and slightly concerning. V is just doing a live autopsy to find out what the symbol is, in the classic V way, so basically scaring the hell out of me. Uzi reveals that N's hat is some kind of pilot hat, meaning he piloted the drop pod onto Copper 9, and also crashed and and everything, but how could you say no to that face? This information angers V, but I guess bubbles are her comfort thing, or we can add being bipolar to the list of mental illnesses she possesses. N comments on the fact that going to Earth and killing all the humans isn't morally correct. Uzi points out the fact that JC Jensen sent them to Copper 9 without a communications relay and reformatted N's memories to soup, which explains why the beginning of the episode seemed to fizzle away like a corrupted video file. Uzi seems absolutely hell-bent on genocide, and this causes some tension between V and Uzi, as V still wants to kill her pretty badly. N stated that Jay was receiving orders from someone via their slightly busted comms relay, but he doesn't actually know who. Cut back to the worker drone home, and this technician bloke is trying to repair the hole in the roof. When he sees the body of Jay doing something strange, the open chest cavity pulsates and tenses like there's a heartbeat of some description. And then this little robot thing comes out, and we are first introduced to the Absolute Solver. It appears and massacres the technician. The Absolute Solver was referenced in episode 1 on N's death screen, with the phrase blocked by administrator, implying that he doesn't have this grotesque mass of limbs and blood. I swear, if they kill N off, I will cry my eyes out. Hashtag N cures depression. Can we get that trend? on Twitter, please. After the Absolute Solver, um, gently introduces the technician to the idea of a concrete paving slab, we cut to the parent-teacher conference between Uzi's teacher and Khan. In the classic teacher way, he states that Uzi is exactly normal in class, even taking someone sentience at one point, and I swear that's against the Geneva Convention. This teacher, who for the sake of ease I'm gonna call Mr. Cumstain, suggests that there might be something wrong with Uzi's programming, which is sort of true, she keeps on having these glitches and is comfortable with hanging out with murder drones. But at the same time, dick move mate. The conference is cut short by an incident occurring and we cut back to Uzi having a god complex. No, no, okay, yep. Turns out, this guy, who was introduced in episode 1 but was so inconsequential, I think he was mentioned by name once, has come to give Uzi back her sick-ass laser gun. Also, I'm pretty sure his name is Thad, by the way, which is, uh bit of a weird one. Thad states that there has been many recent disappearances at the colony, in a wonderful showcase of dramatic irony. We already know that it's the absolute solver xenomorphing people up into vents, like he didn't see the event was drooling in alien isolation. <laughs> After stating that Jay's corpse was nowhere to be found, he states, Looked like it crawled away? And this causes N distress. He clearly knows that Jay's corpse being able to reanimate itself is bad news. Uzi decides that going back to the colony is probably a pretty good idea. And cutting back to the colony, we see that the absolute solver has the ability to mimic the voices and bodies of the people it claims. Sure, the hologram looks like something out of the first Star Wars movie, but this thing is a learning algorithm. In many ways, the absolute solver is the bastard child of the xenomorph skidwalkers 1982's The Thing. Anyway, it lures another robot into it before stabbing him and dragging him up into the vents. Cutting back to Uzi, Thad, and N, they've made it back to the colony. Now, everyone's still a little bit touchy about N's mm, murderous rampage. I mean, fair. So N apologises in the best way possible. And then he makes this face. I mean, how could you say no to that? Now, I'm, I'm just going to slide a uh, hashtag N cures depression here again, because he does. They decide to let him in, because how could you say no to that face? Another quick cut with some camera flashes, and we're at the crime scene of the guy who was murdered by... Yeah, ew. Also, I like how in this shot you can see a CPU socket, and I'm also 90% sure that that's a 775 socket, which implies that these worker drones use Core 2 duos or Core 2 quads, which would explain a lot. So the police are investigating and doing their thing. Uzi, N, and Thad sneak by the crime scene, which wasn't actually real, just another illusion by the Absolute Solver brought to you in stunning 4K Ultra HD. Also, I like how the coffee mug was fake, it's just funny. Back to the parent teacher conference, we get properly introduced to these two characters, who were in episode 1 but shared about one line of dialogue between them. These characters are Lizzie and Dom. Yes, 
That's her name. That's what the wiki says. Little interjection. Lizzie, complete bitch. Makes fun of Uzi. Pretty much that one girl in class never does any work. Doll, only speaks Russian. Only character to do this, by the way. Heart based in Joya and has 400 hours in Metro Exodus. And for some reason, these two are friends. Anyway, Lizzie asks Doll where her folks are, and we get this scene. We see many quick cuts with a red hue on them. This implies that Doll's family were brutally killed, probably by the murder drones. If we grab one of the frames and enhance it a bit using the power of AI and the DaVinci Resolve Brighton feature, we can see that the damage sustained to the corpses is consistent with damage that we see from other murder drone attacks. Her family were very clearly killed by the murder drones and all she could do was watch. Turns out that Lizzie was trying to tell a joke anyway. Who makes jokes like that? Seriously. There's a knock at the door and you are led to believe that this thing at the door is another classmate of theirs, but it's actually the absolute solver. Who are you expecting? Elvis bloody Presley. Lizzie is about to let her in when Doll does this. And that is the exact same symbol that appeared in Uzi's eye earlier. Could Doll be linked with the drones as well? Whilst all of this is going down, Uzi, Thad and N are investigating where they left Jay's corpse, and they see it on the walls, loads and loads and loads of Absolute Solver logos, which are the exact same symbol that Doll and Uzi possess. This raises so many questions. Do Doll and Uzi have the Absolute Solver? They both seem to have some kind of kinesis power, like they went to Gatherer's Garden in the first Bioshock game, and whenever they use it, the same symbol appears, but there isn't any evidence to suggests that the solver itself has kinesis, otherwise it would just drag people away without needing to stab them first. Little is revealed by this revelation, but oh, so many questions are raised. But just be patient, we'll get there eventually. Uzi puts two and two together and guesses that the absolute solver must be some kind of auto-run program to help limbs regrow. In the event that the wound is severe enough that it can't easily be regrown, new material needs to be supplemented to fill the gaps. Hence why the solver relies on luring and killing to sustain itself. Uzi is cut short by N putting a hand over her mouth, as a disturbingly well-animated human hand comes out of the dark darkness and crawls and grabs onto Thad's leg. N fires a missile to see what the hell is grabbing onto Thad, and that's when we see it. The absolute solver. Do you see now why I said this thing looks like 982's The Thing? There are certainly similarities at least. The solver tries to drag Thad away, but N apparently went to the ninja school and perfectly throws a ninja scar to cut the hand off. Nice shot, N. Have you considered joining the NBA because she's certainly got the freaking height for it? Jesus! The victory is short-lived as Thad is grabbed again and dragged off. Giving chase, Uzi and N catch sight of the absolute solver mimicking Thad's voice from just his screen. Why do people like this character again? Please answer me that. The hologram glitches out and N yeets a ninja star and Uzi kicks it to cut down Thad. Why is everyone in this show a badass, man? I suppose it comes when you don't have to worry about dying from more than one bullet. The solver reveals its many GLaDOS-like eyes and she even sounds like GLaDOS. It's revealed that the murder drone bodies are like puppets for the solver and then it shows a hologram of Uzi's mother with the same symbol on her eye with the line it hurts our feelings you don't remember us. The line, it hurts our feelings that you don't remember us, actually backs up my theory from episode 1 about this grotesque flesh pile from the picture being Uzi's mother. The thing has many similarities to the absolute solver, and like I theorised, Uzi's mother was purple, so this hand is 100% hers. We know that Uzi's mum definitely had the absolute solver, implying that Uzi does as well, seeing as the symbols on their eyes match one to one. This thing appears after Uzi refused to be assimilated. This thing could be right off my Cheerios. The solver then produces Uzi's dad Khan and then tears him in half. Uzi appears to help N, but this is another hologram shown by the solver. Honestly, this thing gets worse and worse by the second. It crushes the crystal in the laser gun, and the solver is about to kill Uzi when N comes in and chainsaws the solver's heads off. Someone clearly took a leaf out of Doom Guy's book. The destroyed crystal then turns red and detonates, and Uzi and N barely make it out of there. Thank goodness N has wings. With the solver defeated, it is revealed that Khan isn't really dead, but it was just a hologram to fuck with Uzi. The final part of the solver tries to sneak away, but N causing it to implode. N leaves because Uzi fears him after what he saw. Khan and Uzi share a hug and M slips away into the darkness. Cutting back to the classroom, Doll is staring at a picture. Some kind of cockroach thing shows up. Reminds me a lot of Wally, actually. Doll makes the cockroach explode, which I personally think was unneeded, and licks the oil off her face. It's revealed that the picture she was looking at was a V, I think. It's kind of hard to tell. It could also be N. They have kind of similar hairstyles. Leave me alone. N is moping around in the drop pod because he thinks he's a monster, which he isn't. He's the best. V tries to hide the fact that the 
the chain keeping her restrained is broken. I'm not sure why they thought a chain would work when these things can literally summon chainsaws from their hands, but I digress. We see Uzi staring up at the ceiling in her room with another child's drawing next to her. I assume it's N as the character in blue has a yellow tail and the art style looks similar to N's if we cross-reference it with the card he gave to the guy earlier. We see that Uzi is staring at some evidence board of some kind, trying to link everything she saw today with some sort of logic. We see pictures of Jay Solva, the symbol, and loads of other crazed ramblings. And just like that, the episode cuts to black. Now, in this episode, we are taught that the absolute solver is something that all murder drones have, and it's some sort of puppeteer that manipulates the murder drone chassis. Both Uzi and Doll have the absolute solver plus some kind of kinesis power. Doll clearly has more practice in using said kinesis power, whereas Uzi can't control it as well and keeps on accidentally cracking mirrors. We learn more about Uzi's past, knowing that she was linked with the absolute solver as she has the same symbol as it. Khan clearly knows more than he's letting on. We also know that Uzi is somewhat scarred by the whole experience and writes crazed ramblings on the ceiling. As you do. Another thing that occurred to me whilst I was writing this was the absolute solver's constant use of, of nouns such as we and us when referring to itself. And my super awesome film theory is that it's some kind of collective, kind of like the Borg from Star Trek. It's lots of different entities controlling the same chassis simultaneously. But anyway, that's just a theory at this time. I could be completely wrong. I probably am completely wrong. I am on most things. As the series goes on, we will fall further and further down the rabbit hole, deeper and deeper into the insanity of this world. So without further ado, let's get into episode three, my personal favourite episode because N wears a suit and it's just completely adorable. Episode 3 starts with some eerie lighting and camera angles. We see some sort of sign made out of balloons advertising the school prom, a darkened corridor with flashing lights revealing dozens of missing persons posters. Also, quick interjection, I love how some of these posters have really funny stuff on them. The one in the centre says, last seen confusing the ancient artifact in the office with a personality core. How you confuse those two things I don't know. The one on the left says, being a bad person but that's okay, it's a fine narrative path to take. And this one says, constantly talking about how much her limb and organs were so intact, god she's insufferable. Uh, black comedy. I think whoever wrote these missing person posters might have some unprocessed issues. Also, I like how the phone numbers are IP addresses. I just hope to god those IP addresses are fake and the animators didn't out themselves. But our super fun time laughing at missing persons posters is interrupted by a girl running past the camera. Her glasses get broken by some kind of red kinesis power. Now, where have I seen that before? Hmm. A CCTV camera gets turned away from the scene and then we see Doll standing at the end of the hallway. She uses her kinesis powers to tear the girl's arm off and then kills her off screen using a meat cleaver ninja star attack. We see Doll enter her dorm room, stepping on a similar looking cockroach to the one we saw last episode. It's clear that she has some sort of hatred for them. Doll takes out a piece of paper and a pen and crosses another name off a list marked Prom Queen Candidates. She's clearly been the person behind all of those disappearances, and she's probably the person who wrote all the last scene sections on the missing persons posters. The camera pans out to two blurry figures, who Doll refers to as Mum and Dad. This shows the fact that she kept the corpses of her parents when V attacked. The bodies are clearly undergoing some kind of robot decay as they're covered in dozens of robot cockroaches. And then, the screen cuts to black. We can see that Doll is seemingly attacking people and then reporting them as missing. But why? Why would she need to do that? The attacks only seem to be happening on people that are in the running for being prom queen. Maybe Doll is doing this because she wants to be the prom queen herself. Bit of an extreme length to go, but you do you. Plus, we also get to see what kind of conditions Doll is living in, and also how she uses her powers day to day, like putting books back on the shelf without needing to touch them. Personally, I think that is very, very useful. Also, we also find out that her apartment is completely filthy, with two rotting robot corpses in the corner. I really think someone should call the Robo HOA. There's a fizzle transition to a memory. This memory is of Uzi being scared of N after she witnesses the solver, which is... <clears throat> completely fair. The camera zooms out to show her in sleep mode, with the phrase guilt mode activated on her visor. She clearly feels guilty about making N feel like a monster. We see Uzi surrounded by her crazed ramblings, along with some school textbooks. We see that since last episode, she's pinned N's drawing of himself and her onto the evidence board. Now we can see it more clearly. It says, thank you for being my friend. Oh, that's gonna sting, isn't it? Uzi then spends the entire day groaning and feeling guilty about losing N as a friend. Also, I know that's not a normal way to sit, but I'm not gonna bring that up. Seeing as I do the same thing as XQC sometimes, so I'm not one to talk about sitting weirdly. As she rifles through her locker, some girl kicks the books the way she was using to prop herself up. 
Huh, if you'll ask. She throws a book at the girl and misses and nails the guy whose head's on fire. Someone clearly did play Hitman in 2016. Uzi goes to pick up a book when she lays eyes on the dozens of missing person posters on the notice board, with the girl from the intro to the episode being newly added. It's now that we see the extent of Doll's murder spree. I count 21 different missing persons posters. Uzi sees the janitor cleaning up the remains of the girl from last night and the camera that has been turned around by Doll's kinesis power. Instead of being melancholy, she starts cackling like a witch gathers up the posters and literally skips into her room. She's about to put them on her wall of crazed ramblings when suddenly... Do you remember when I said that she scares me? This! This is why! The camera cuts to someone looking over Uzi's crazed notes. They put them on a shelf and the camera pans out and we see that it's Khan. We see that he puts the notes in a room with a sign saying Nori's kooky insane stuff. Finally, we have a name for Uzi's mother, Nori. With this single sign, we know that she was most definitely messing around with the absolute solver. Perhaps she even had the same crazed rambling phase as Uzi, as we see lots of stacks of paper in the room. So it isn't completely out of the question that Nori documented her experiences is whilst being infected with the solver. Uzi is moderately pissed about having all of her evidence stolen and has a mild explosion. Khan states that crazed ramblings aren't covered under a non-optional family support structure. Uzi explains that Khan was never there for her and after she had one moment of weakness after seeing a hologram of her dead mum, which is totally fair by the way, I'd react the same, now he's trying to help. She states that the best thing you can do now is stay distant. Uzi is about to leave and talk to N when she stumbles across a human skeleton with a propeller beanie and a popsicle. Also, I like the detail of the popsicle not melting because it's nuclear winter outside. Khan states that it's a prom dress in child small size. I told you Uzi was a short ass. Khan says that she's banned from talking to the murder drones and he says he's found some of her classmates to go to prom with. Turns out it's Lizzie and Doll. Damn it, where's the BFG 9000 when you need it? Maybe you should have made that instead of a laser gun that you keep misnaming constantly. Having been told that Khan is chaperoning, Uzi has the normal reaction. There's a cut to two more bodies in prom outfits. V and N are deciding whether or not to put them on and sneak into the worker drone home. By the way guys, the tails would be a dead giveaway so I advise watching out for that. N knows that it's a bad idea to go back and he's, as he still remembers the fear on Uzi's face and knows that they are too dangerous to interact with the worker drones. V's plan was to go there in the prom dress. Uzi lets them in because she has no friends. They kill everyone and decapitate Uzi. N states that he isn't freeing her for the sake of prom murder because they can't recreate Carrie that's still under copyright. Plus, he fears that they all have the solver and that they all grew up in a haunted mansion which backs up my theory that the robot with glasses was V. Also, all you had to do for the mansion to not be haunted was not let the creepy little ghost girl in. Wait a minute, wrong game. V seems totally unconcerned about knowing where they came from or what they are. But then again, V seems to have a moment where she realises that N is right, and she wishes that N and Uzi would stop prying into their past. She states that if N frees her now, they'll only kill what they need to survive. N is unaware that the train is broken. There is a cut and we are back at Doll's apartment. She managed to clean out the oil and bodies. She states that her parents are sleeping as she's covered both of the bodies with a sheet. Uzi sees the massive cockroaches on the wall and knows that something is desperately wrong here. She tries to leave but the door slams shut in her face and Doll freaking teleports in front of it. Seriously, that is so creepy and plus the fact that she doesn't speak English is creepier still. I don't know why but there are some languages that just sound super creepy when spoken softly, those being German and Russian. Back at the drop pod, N tries to reason with B but she cuts his head off and escapes. At Doll's place, the tap strip oil lovely, and Uzi has gotten ready for prom. She looks at herself and the Absolute Solver logo comes back on her eye. She tries to prevent it from smashing the mirror, but alas, it happens anyway. Through the mirror, she hears Lizzie state that We'll notice she's missing. Just do your thing and I'll let in V. We'll see you there. This implies that their plan was to lure Uzi to Doll's place and kill her, and then Lizzie would let V into the prom. But why? If V killed Doll's parents, why would she ever want to see her again? Secrets will be revealed in time, my friend. Uzi sees the shower with blood leaking out of it. Yep, many household items do that on the regular, don't worry. She texts behind the curtain and we cut back to N post regrowing his head. N realises that V took the prom dress and ran. N goes to give chase but hesitates. He's about to leave when he decides to put the suit on. Yes! Dapper N! Sorry. <clears throat> Turns out Uzi saw a load of discarded mirrors with masses of red growths on them. I don't know why, but I get serious Resident Evil 7 vibes from this. It's like the moulded with this weed stuff growing on every surface it touches. This explains why the curtain had blood on it. Doll is about to come in and murder Uzi when she realises that Uzi escapes by making an improvised ladder out of the mirrors and escaping through a ventilation shaft. And then she has one of the best lines in the entire series. <laughs> Ой, я должна была предположить, что кто-то сможет убежать через вентиляцию, используя выброшенное зеркало как ступеньки. 
Uzi books it outside and runs into N, who's wearing the suit. Ah, yes! Dapper N! Best N, and you cannot change my mind. They're both a little surprised to see each other. The two rebond, and N says they're dapper buddies, and Uzi makes a literal uwu face. Cut back to prom, and it looks pretty boring, to be honest. Like, I'm pretty sure I've seen funerals with more life to them. I'm so glad I didn't go to mine. I stayed at home playing Left 4 Dead. Khan is moderately concerned that Uzi isn't there yet as he should be, it's only your daughter mate. Lizzie comes up on stage and says seeing as the other candidates have mysteriously disappeared, the prom queen by forfeit is V. V hesitates after being told that she's prom queen and after Lizzie threatens to get her dad to dock everyone's grades, they all start clapping for V. V decides that doing a speech and then killing everyone is extra si sinister. Gold is about to attack when Uzi and N crash the party. A little bit confused as V isn't attacking and is also in a prom dress. Doll doesn't hesitate and impales V's hands on wires, throws Lizzie to one side and also snaps some girl's neck and flattens her. I don't know why I found that scene really funny, probably for the same reason Shaun of the Dead is funny. Doll uses her solver to force V to remember her killing Doll's family. So Doll kills all of the prom queens and lured V here for the sake of revenge. This series really is a rabbit hole of twist turns, body horror, broken teeth and slipping sanity. Doll impales V through the stomach. V manages to get her hand free and starts firing at Doll, but the solver has some kind of force field around her and the bullets have no effect. After Uzi and N prevent Doll from using a fan bay to decapitate V, Doll questions why why Uzi would side with the drones, as she isn't the only one who's lost family to them, further adding to the conclusion that Nori was killed by murder drones. Uzi says that she may not be dealing with stuff well, but she's done dealing with stuff alone. She makes this face at N, I swear these two are the perfect dream team. Doll isn't phased and impales N's arm before throwing knives at him. N pushes Uzi away and gets sliced. I don't know why, but like, robots dying always upsets me, like I cried when BT died in Titanfall 2. Khan goes to help, but Doll shuts the door on him. Doll tries to crush Uzi using the solver, but her heads up display states that Uzi has the solver, so she is impervious to the effects. See, I was right. Uzi did inherit the solver from Nori. Turns out that N and V are completely okay and managed to escape with only missing arms. V berates Lizzie for being a traitor, but Lizzie retorts by bringing up the fact that V was using her to kill everyone anyway. Uzi and Doll fight. A knife hits the DJ rig, causing music to play. Uzi ends up getting pinned, and N saves her from a knife barrage. The two do an awesome move and do a knife to rocket combo right as the music climaxes. God, that scene was so well done. I swear, these two have pirated John Wick at least more than once. The two tried to share a moment, but Doll yeets the table at them. N throws Uzi and takes one for the team. Doll throws two tables at Uzi while she's mid-air. Uzi manages to turn for two away across the tables, kicks a flying knife at Doll which cuts a wristband off and then kicks her in the face. Doll is about to attack her again when V shoots her in the face from behind. Yep, she's very dead. Uzi gets pissed as they needed Doll for answers. V tries to tell her that Doll is fine, but that body begs to fucking differ. Lucky for them, the wristband has a key to Doll's room on it. They go to the room and find loads and loads of worker drone corpses, probably all from the missing robots that Doll smited. The bodies look like they've been fed on. Uzi asks why a worker drone would need to do that. After all she's seen, why can't she just get to the conclusion that Doll isn't a normal worker drone? I don't get that. After looking through some of the parts, Uzi looks for the oil on her fingers and seems to get some kind of hankering for it. There's a camera change and we see that N and V have found Doll's folks. N looks over at Uzi who is in the middle of licking the oil off her fingers. This shows that the solver slowly turns whoever is infected with it into a murder drone, like a parasite of some kind. Doll has clearly had the solver for a while as she started to need to kill and drink oil to sustain her powers. Uzi can't control her powers so she's only just developed the taste for oil. Anyway, V states that Doll's parents didn't even taste good. N states that she kind of sucks and V says, Yeah. Not doing okay. As they search the bodies, Doll teleports back in, drags the bullet out of her skull and fires it at Uzi. Ah yes, the old soap gambit. The screen cuts to black and the shot goes off, and when the screen reopens again, we see Uzi has caught it using the Kinesis powers. I guess all she needed to do to gain control of her powers was a drop of oil. Doll states that she's sorry and that if she finds what she's looking for, she'll help Uzi too. But what is she looking for? A cure to the solver perhaps? It must be as she needed to get to V. There must have been some other reason other than revenge. Maybe by dismembering her, Doll could learn more about the parasite that's infected her own body. Doll teleports away and we cut outside. Some worker drone is looking for his glasses and nearly gets hit by a drop pod. A figure comes out of a second pod and decapitates the worker. We see that on her name tag is the name Tessa, the same name as the girl from the mansion in episode 2. This is most likely an older version of her. She states that they've got some work to do and then Jay reappears. Damn it, we nearly went a whole episode without her. We see that Tessa and Jay walk off into the toxic death storm and the episode cuts 
to black. In this episode, we find out that the solver is some kind of parasite that infects the host and slowly turns them into a murder drone. We can tell this because at the beginning of the series, when we first see Dole, she seems seemingly normal, and it's only now that she's starting to cannibalize worker drones in order to sustain her kinesis powers. And also the fact that she can seemingly regrow limbs, as when V shot her in the face, she could just pull the bullet out, fire it back, and her face repaired perfectly fine. We also know that the infection is taking a hold of Uzi as she wasn't able to resist licking the oil off of her fingers. We also finally know one, Uzi's mother's name, that being Nori, and we also know that Nori definitely was infected with the absolute solver and was documenting her journey, hence why Khan has that closet labelled Nori's kooky insane stuff. We learn a lot more about Uzi's past and what Doll's problem is. Also we see Ed in a suit and that's just great. These are the reasons why this is my favourite episode, just because it does clean up a lot of questions that we had and plus we finally know what this absolute solver thing is. So without further ado, let's just get directly into episode 4, the camp episode, which uh, I'm not really sure why robots need to go to camp. Do they have Cub Scouts as well? Answer me that, glitch, if you're watching this. Episode 4 starts with a school bus slowly pulling into a place dubbed Camp 98.7. The driver for some reason is riding on top of the bus like a horse. It's just funny to me and it sort of makes sense seeing as they're all machines at the end of the day. As the class exit the bus, we see all of the teen slasher movie stereotypes. The nerd, the stoner, the jock, the guy whose phone won't work at the crucial time. Also, bro finally put his head out. Thanks guys. Jock number 2 and generic hot girl service number 250907. That being Thad and Lizzie. But the looks of things, we're about to recreate onto Dawn, The Quarry, and pretty much every other supermassive game that exists. Uzi exits the bus, wearing a suspiciously large backpack with wings. Okay, so, number one, this is foreshadowing, and you'll see why in a second, and two, make merch of this please. I want this backpack, it's cool as hell and I need it in my existence. I mean, currently my existence is comprised of murder drones in Titanfall 2, so I think it would fit quite nicely. She looks at two of charms in her hand, the wristband from Doll and her own choker, both of which have the same skull pendant on them. We cut to some photos, and it turns out Khan is telling Uzi about his time at Camp 98.7. He states that at the time he didn't notice them, multiple people wearing skull pendants. He says that Nori was all about building doors against the coming sky demon. The singularity awakens, look at this cool S I can draw. Also I swear to god, those things were bloody everywhere in British schools. If I see one more of those sodding S signs, I swear to god. This revelation shows that Nori knew about the murder drones for months, if not years, before they actually arrived. This implies that she was infected with the solver before the drones actually arrived. And it also also backs up my theory that the solver is some kind of collective mind due to its use of nouns such as us and we when describing itself. The reason why Nori knew about the drones before they came is because it was all communicated to her using the hive mind. But how did the solver get to the planet in the first place? I don't know, okay? Leave me alone. Uzi puts Doll's pendant in her pocket and puts her own choker back on. One of her classmates asks why they are here and it turns out Uzi wanted to go alone but the teacher is mad at their test scores and he's got not getting an end of year bonus so no teaching. But they aren't unsupervised because... Yeah, N and V agreed to be camp counsellors, and I will never understand these two's affinity to dress up in random outfits, but I welcome it wholeheartedly. N tries to get them to count one another, but when they refuse, V just shoots one of them in the face. She's got some good aim, probably from playing too many light gun shooters. I don't actually own a CRT or a copy of Resident Evil Survivor, so I'm just pointing a Nerf gun at my monitor, and playing a video of someone playing through the game, I look almost as insane as Nori. N states they have so many distracting activities to do, so no sneaking off to investigate stuff, he says whilst looking directly at Uzi. Subtlety really isn't your strong suit, mate. N tries to get them to go to the bunks, but they're all terrified, and fair, they are getting chaperoned by murder drones. Thad and Lizzie aren't scared because they've had run-ins with them before, and also Lizzie loots a gold watch from the kid who got domed like she's playing Fallout New Vegas. I didn't put the body there, simple Peter, leave me alone. After Uzi says that the murder drones are her friends too, everyone goes running to them. I I think it's because they feel sorry for the drones having to put up with Uzi. I mean, come on guys, she's really not that bad. I'm not gonna finish that sentence. I'm 90% sure V is about to rip this kid's arm off when Uzi gives her a look and V states, Just full of love. 
With that face, I doubt you are, love. With the kids suitably distracted and one of them hitting on N, you're not 18, love. Stop it. Uzi sneaks off to go look for some answers. Uzi, could you bring some back? I'm in desperate need of one. I swear I saw one under here. Uzi travels through the opening to Splinter Cell Double Agent. I say that because it's really snowy before she stumbles on two abandoned cabins. I just want to say from this point onward, shit is about to get fucky in a big way. Uzi uses her powers to break into the cabin. She'd be a very good thief. This proves my theory from episode 3 that in order to control her powers, all she needed was some oil. We see a cockroach that looks like the one from Doll's apartment skitter away into the cabin. As Uzi searches the place using a flashlight, she's manipulating with her powers. Uzi sees a calendar. She takes it down, looks at it. There's a date stating that all the dogs from the camp were evacuated. Wait a minute, this is 1982's The Thing. Literally, like, hear me out, Arctic setting, body horror, infections, and dogs being the epicenter. It literally is. <clears throat> Sorry about that, got a little bit fanboy there for a minute. Uzi breathes a sigh of relief as all the dogs were evacuated off Copper 9 before the nuclear winter. There's a clattering sound and Uzi searches around and we see some kind of robot ghost followed by another human hand. I think our friend the Solver is here. Also, the whole scary ghost thing disappears between camera shots. It's not scary, it's cheap. You're not the mortuary assistant, stop it. There's a scream outside and it turns out it's just the other campers rowing on a frozen lake. And this girl will not stop hitting on N. He likes V and you're not 18, leave him alone. I hope to God the robots have consent laws. That was officially the weirdest sentence I've ever said. Uzi looks on at them and accidentally breaks the window. She seems to lose control of her powers for a second as she gets a high temperature warning on her visor. It's like she's having some kind of manic episode. We see a robot hand in her bag, followed by flashbacks of her sneaking into Doll's room and grabbing it, which explains why her bag was so big in the first place. The solver is very clearly making her become a murder drone as she needs oil to prevent herself from overheating and dying, just like N stated in episode 1. Turns out V is here to make fun of Uzi having a slight manic episode. Uzi quickly kicks her bag away. V states that Uzi said that this camp would help them find answers about dolls, so how about more exploring and less watching from the window like a creep? V intimidates Uzi, saying that she will kill her next. I'd like to see you try, love. And it's only now that I realise whenever she has these kind of psychotic episodes, she seems to go limp slightly and lose control of her body. Perhaps like Uzi, she also has manic episodes, but at the same time, she is completely aware of what she's saying and what she's doing. V states that N has made friends with rocks in the past, so Uzi's death will mean absolutely nothing to him. She scratches Uzi's visor and then slinks off. Yeah, away with you, you bitch. Oh, oh shit. Oh fuck. I'm sorry. Ah! The solver manages to burn the scratch out. I wish it could do the same with my phone screen. Uzi goes and picks up a bag, as well as saving a cockroach using her powers. She salutes it and it disappears under the floorboards. Uzi bends the floorboards away to see where the cockroach went, and she lays eyes on dozens of bodies, probably from previous campers. Uzi gathers some documents, and they all seem to depict an attack by the absolute solver. This is where the infection of Copper 9 started. This must be where Nori got infected with the solver. Perhaps her and Khan were the only two that made it out alive. The solver didn't attack Nori because she was a host. Uzi pulls out a solver fragment out of one of the documents and this green cockroach calls on her hand and uses a chat feature describing an elevator that will probably go down to god knows where. Uzi stares at the thing perplexed and Doll is back, oh dear far at will. We cut back to the campers and whenever they're on screen there's a nice guitar riff playing. I thought it would just I, I just thought I'd point it out, leave me alone. N manages to score so high on archery that he quite literally sets the target alight. Uzi gets N's attention and uses the cockroach to communicate with him. She says to not tell V that she's here. N gets confused and tells tells Uzi to come over to them before freaking out and yelling Wait, no! This is why I love N, he's just amazing. Uzi surprises the group with her arrival, and someone fires an arrow at her. She catches it, but uh, gets another high temperature warning and accidentally turns it into a half-life monster. It seems that the solver program is very CPU intensive. I mean, it is a kinesis power that manipulates physics, so I imagine that it would be. This explains why Uzi can't use it for a very long time without craving some of that sweet, sweet oil. Uzi, you and I have something in common. We're both fueled by black drinks. Oh, it's Dr. Pepper, not Guinness. Shut up. Uzi tries to explain herself as V looks fearful. She replaces her hands with knives and Uzi says, I live in the woods now! and books it into the woods. Uzi breaks into a cabin on the door and she needs to drink oil soon or she'll pack up completely like my PC trying to run Counter-Strike. The ticking of the clock startles her and she can't seem to control her powers as she accidentally breaks every light in the room and causes the last one to become a tentacle monster that slowly engulfs the screen. We cut to N trying to prevent V from going off and killing Uzi. It's clear that she's definitely afraid of the solver and has decided that Uzi is far too dangerous to live. N states that V is scared, and V retorts that she isn't. N says that he is scared because she won't tell him anything.
kind of thing. Uzi is just a kid, just like them. This shows that when they got infected with the solver, it aged them up, but their mental age stayed the same. N asks what V is so afraid of, and V still refuses to speak, but she still looks absolutely petrified. N goes off to hopefully find Uzi before V does. V leaves the campus and travels off into the storm. We cut to two campers who went off from the group, them being a jock and a random girl. They clearly have not seen any of the Friday the 13th movies because this is the last thing you want to do. The two come across an abandoned cabin and decide to go inside. As they break in, we can see a barricade made out of a chair and lots of growths on the walls. This is clearly the same cabin Uzi fled to. Also, now that the growths are black, do you see why I get RE7 vibes from them? The jock barges in and breaks one of the tentacles that was keeping the door shut. As they go further in, a flashlight drops from seemingly nowhere. As the jock picks it up, the door slams behind them. They get startled by it and turn their back on the darkness, something you never want to do in a horror movie. For God's sake, guys, Alien proved this in 1979. We see a wing emerge and a purple X on a visor. I was completely correct. The solver does turn robots into murder drones. Uzi and Nori shared the same fate, slowly losing their minds and their bodies to the solver. Now that we know for sure that this is the case, the picture from EP1 makes even more sense. If Nori lost control completely, then it would make sense that her mutations made her into this gross pile of random shit, which explains why there is a purple hand sticking out of it. N arrives at the cabin and sees a single monitor with static on it. N goes in and pushes some buttons on the computer screen, causing it to spray sparks. And in this scene, we see another pair of eyes staring at the monitor. They're red, so I can only assume that they belong to Doll, scrutinising N as he investigates. There's a VHS tape on the table. N touches it and gets a flashback. We see the robot from episode 2 that caused the memory to glitch out, the Baker residence looking mansion, and some kind of black hole. N is shocked by the sudden interjection. He looks at the tape and we can see it's called Zombie Drones, with the caption, Do not play for robots, they will not like it. Honestly, this tape is going to be a snuff film, I'm calling it. Cutting back to Uzi, we see her feeding on the campers, dismembering them and going to town on the corpses. She tries to control herself, but the solver is very clearly the one in control in this situation. Uzi sees the open door and there's a cut to campers telling scary stories around the fire. The nerd asks if they should be worried about Rebecca and the jock as they haven't returned in a while. Then something grabs her leg. It's what's left of Rebecca. She's basically a crawler zombie from COD Zombies now. Rebecca tries to describe Uzi but can't remember her name so she just says purple eyes and hot topic before carking it. We see Uzi walk up on this hill and control alt delete the fire. Uzi stares at them laughing and letting her tail swing around. None of them still remember her name. So she decapitates this guy and then he catches fire. Damn it, he nearly went a whole episode without being on fire. The remaining camp is split up, making me yell obscenities at my monitor because none of these people have seen a slasher movie. The nerd states that splitting up is a good thing because that's what the book said. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. We see Uzi gives chase. She kills the stoner first and we finally get a good glimpse of her and oh my god, where is my shotgun? Thanks, George. Oh, she's drooling oil. Ah, kill it. Barrage. There. Now. The soundtrack picks up as the stoner screams and Lizzie runs through the forest. Lizzie sees the nerd girl and thinks that she's saved, but no, it's just Uzi manipulating the corpse. Remember when I said shit was going to get fucky? This is why. Uzi's about to murder her when V steps in and prevents that from happening. V states, V, please. New body. Same horrors. But Uzi insists that she doesn't know who that is, and the viewer doesn't know who Sin is either. Well, I do, but I'm not going to tell you because I want to be mysterious, so can you get off my dick? Uzi begs to talk to N, but V isn't going to let up. So Uzi uses her tail to bite V and cut off one of her blades. Uzi manages to stab V through the head, causing her to miss a missile and blow up Lizzie. Uzi manages to pin V against the snow and stab her hand into the ground. Honestly, and people say Manhunt 2 was violent. Oh, wait, yeah, no, it is. V tries to stick Uzi with the nanites, but Uzi cuts her tail off and is about to kill her when N scoops her up. Uzi stabs N in the hand, and this seems to break her out of her murderous trance because the solver logo is gone from her visor. N yeets her up into the air and sticks his hand in his mouth to neutralize the acid. He says, What did I say about antagonizing her? Ugh, you always take her side. This further backs up N's claim earlier that they are just kids as V acts like a child who just got caught stealing cookies. Uzi got chucked so high into the air, I'm pretty sure she could have hit a plane if there was one flying and starts falling. N falls beside her and tries to comfort her as they hurtle towards the planet. What is it with you people and opening up completely the wrong time? Uzi wraps herself in her wings and tries to hide from N, thinking she's a monster just like them. N states that Uzi makes scary stuff fun for him. He states they'll stick together using Uzi's tail as a puppet. Aw, oh, isn't that sweet in a kind of body horror sort of way? <laughs> Uzi laughs and says, <laughs> oh, that timing was perfect. V is still hell-bent on murder, and it turns out N caught Uzi right before they landed, and the two agree to figure this out together. The two share a hug, and V puts her blades away. It's clear that N's crush on her is mutual. Lizzie states, 
don't. And fucks off out the series for good, thank goodness. What's left of the class heads back home with Uzi and Ellen sleeping on the bus. Oh, ain't that adorable. Sun starts to leak into the cabin through the windows and it burns Uzi's hand, just like N stated in episode one. N pulls Uzi's hand out of the sun and looks to his side. He kept the tape. And with that, episode four cuts to black. Now, I know this episode was a lot to take in, because it is, and trust me, you haven't been working on this thing for two weeks and your mind isn't completely frazzled. Anyway, I'm going to use this segment to kind of uh, clear up a few things that may have happened, because I know this episode was really confusing and a lot to take in. So in this episode, my theory has proven that the Absolute Solver is some kind of parasite, that when the individual is infected, they slowly become more and more like disassembly units until they mutate sprout wings and a tail and become murderous. We also know that Uzi temporarily lost control of herself but once the Solver properly took hold in her body, and it almost seems that she actually enjoyed the killing of her classmates, which I mean, fair, that most of those guys were complete dickheads. Uh, we know that Nori's mutation was extremely bad to the point where she is this mess of limbs and yellow ooze that we see in the picture with Khan. Uh, we also know that Uzi burns in the sun now, so subsequent episodes will all be set at night, meaning I've now got to brighten more images. Thanks, animators. This episode reveals a lot. I mean, we now know that the Solver is actually a parasite and that V knows a lot more about it than she's letting on. She also knows a lot more about N's past and... Maybe she doesn't want to tell him. We don't know why she doesn't want to tell him. It could be out of fear. It could be maybe N won't like it. We just don't know. She also mentions the character of Sin. Now, this name will become very, very important later. And the more attentive amongst you might have actually remembered it on N's death screen in episode one, when the screen said, Absolute Solver blocked by Administrator Sin. I'm sure we'll meet this Sin character soon enough. Actually, I know we'll meet this Sin character soon enough. I've already watched the episode. Honestly, I swear this entire series was planned three years in advance, man. Like, oh my god. Without any further prevarication, let's get on to episode five, because I want to finish this damn thing by Monday. Famous last words. <laughs> The intro to this episode is slightly different to the rest of the episodes in the series. Halfway through, it zooms out to an old CRT playing a VHS tape. I honestly, I legit thought my headphones were broken on first viewing, that or the headphone jack was on the fritz again. We see the JC Jensen in Space logo appear, with some calming music in the background that you'd expect from a company training video. Perhaps this is the tape that N found on Camp 98.7. We see on the tip for a few frames that there's an FBI warning, detailing it that it is a federal crime for civilians to copy this tape. But why? What could possibly on this tape to warrant such a screen. The FBI screen glitches off and we see that it is a technician training video. The phrase WD disassembly is on screen. I can only assume that WD stands for worker drone. We see some statistics marked client reasons for worker drone disassembly and disposal. The highest reason being unit damage and upgrading models. There are a few other reasons such as core failsafe trip. What did your core to do over brain overheat or something? And terminating operations. What the fuck does that mean? We see that the worker drone disassembly is a two-step process. One, there is a software cleanup and the drone is marked for disposal. We can also see the improper disposal of AIs is a punishable offence by fines and imprisonment. Chat GPT indeed. They then upload something called WDOS 606, which I can only assume is some kind of kill code, as the cartoon drone has X's on its eyes for a few frames. Also, I doubt that. Next, there is a hardware cleanup. The core is inspected to confirm disconnection, and then the drone is fed into a disassembly unit. I assume that this tape is from when JC Jensen were first experimenting with AI, as this disassembly unit looks nothing like the disassembly units we know. Perhaps this is the first gen model and the drones that we see in the series are V2s or V3s. Then the bits are inspected. The tape then glitches out and we cut to a title card saying zombie drones. It's clear that a zombie drone is some kind of event that can happen if certain parameters are met. One, the core isn't disconnected properly. Two, the hardware isn't destroyed properly. Or three, the kill code is interrupted or rejected immediately or up to five years later. This reminds me of that scene from Detroit Become Human where Marcus gets thrown into a pit full of half-dead robots and is just left there to rot. Good game by the way. We can see that there are three main reasons why a termination rejection can occur. This being either a technician error, a faulty OS string, meaning that the kill code can't interact with the OS properly, or failsafe wear. The tape finally stops working completely as the TV turns yellow and we zoom out onto dozens of robot corpses that have been disposed of. This is literally that one scene from Detroit Become Human. There is a camera pan under the pile of corpses. It slowly pans down and we see a particular robot corpse. We can clearly see that it looks like it's been shot in the face, but it activates anyway, and it has yellow eyes, which is uncharacteristic of worker drones. This guy has clearly had some kind of kill code rejection like the video said. The camera pans up and we see just how deep under the corpses this guy is. There's a bright flash and we cut outside the Jensen residence. Actually, I've just realised, I wrote that in the script but it's actually, they're actually called the Elliots. They're not the Jensens. 
shit. We see a gate marked restricted and the camera jumps inside. We see dozens of yellow eyed worker drones all with the same error, error code 606, the same number that the kill code OS is named after. We see all these bots have been terminated. The camera pans and we see N reading a book about dogs. Can this guy get any cuter? As N flips through, we see a drawing, N attempting to draw lizards and J drawing herself with the caption, kill yourself. What are you, that one YouTuber or something? N yeets the piece of paper away and goes back to reading his book. Suddenly there's a banging on the floorboard behind this deactivated robot. N stares at the floorboards and a book falls down titled Danger. It's obvious whatever is banging is bad news. Two more books fall down called Enter and The Spooky Basement. Okay Mr Poltergeist, I get it, you can stop hounding me now. I'll go down into the basement but I'm taking Yahtzee with me. N stares on in terror as the banging escalates but he decides to peace out instead of listening to the poltergeist. You clearly haven't played Phasmophobia my friend because not listening to ghosts is usually a bad idea. Just because they're non-corporeal doesn't mean they don't have emotions you racist. We cut to a robot called cockroach. It goes to sip on some oil but then gets stabbed by a familiar voice. Miss Solver is clearly here. N comes in and Solver states that he's sad. There's a flash and we see the Solver for a few flames. GLaDOS, you never told me that you had a sister. Fuck you. The power flicks on and off and we see the Solver's mask. That robot from episode 2. It's all coming together. The reason why the robot caused the memory to glitch out is because she wanted to erase herself from N's memories because she is the source of what he is going through. You sadistic little bitch. She asks if he wants to attend the gala with her and takes a sip of her oil tea but misses her mouth complete. It's interesting that the solver doesn't seem to have complete motor function just yet. This may be because she hasn't done enough puppeteering to get good at it yet. N states that he's not sure if they're invited and the solver climbs up onto the bar in the cutest way possible. Climbing. Crisscross applesauce. I find it kind of cute how she narrates all her movements. She asks if she's not wanted. N is about to speak when blood drips from the ceiling onto the thing he's cleaning. He wipes it away and we see another message. I think you better listen to it, N. It's getting antsy. N ignores it again and Captain America's that shit. N says, Don't give me those eyes. Giggle. I am so naughty. I like how it's a stock image and they didn't even pay for it. That just, it just makes it funnier to me because I do that a lot in my review by a moron series. I just download them off Google Images. The Solver states that the flesh demands invitation. N says that the last Tessa, and if not, movie night. The Solver does a sheepish nod. It appears that it can display emotions perfectly fine on the visor, but it doesn't have complete motor function and walks around like a Gmod ragdoll with half the bones missing. The two enter a dining area of sorts and this guy, who I can only assume is Mr. Elliot, who for the sake of convenience, I'm just going to call Dickless, kills a worker drone for not getting the cutlery right. We see another shadow demon talking to Jay, this being Tessa from episode 2. She's having a mild freak out and talks in an Australian accent. Can we get like Land Down Under to play but like a shitty a cappella version done by me so I don't get claimed? <laughs> Tessa sees N and picks him up and twirls him around and turns him into something new. Don't you want me baby? Uh oh. Sorry. <clears throat> N sees another message on the steamed up window saying that when he's about to die, speak this username. And also, I'd expect that from a CSGO player with divorced parents, not a cool poltergeist hacker. Tessa sees that N brought the solver with her and Tessa doesn't seem best pleased. And also Jay forgot to let her out of the basement timeout again, probably for feeding on corpses again. Tessa gets berated by her mother for bringing the drones in. Honestly, what is it with rich guys and being such c she also said that the broken drones in the library are getting dumped tomorrow. Also, V is one of the broken drones. I just thought I'd mention that. The solver steps up and says that the drones aren't broken and that they can't throw them away anymore. The mother... Okay, I need a funny name for her. Hang on a minute. Mmm, Spunk Goggle Wee Wee. There you go. So Spunk Goggle Wee Wee is about to deck the solver when N steps up and says that he told her to say that. After N vouches for the solver, he gets tied to a tree and pecked by birds as a punishment. This could be a reference to Prometheus in Greek mythology, who was punished for giving the gift of fire to man and cast down into the underworld to be pecked by birds for all of eternity. This could also be a nod to Portal 2's Turret of Wisdom, which can be found in the two chapters, which tells this exact story. I mean, the solver is also a reference to GLaDOS, and also that's official, you can quote me on that. After N throws a stick that gets caught by another bird, the crows turn on him. As he's getting pecked, he says the name of the CSGO player and all the birds leave. Another one spawns in, this one being black and white. The bird throws shapes that I'm 90% sure are deadly is going to result in fractures in Cs 4 through 15. It glows and falls to the ground and it slowly gets back up and we see a purple solver logo. The bird is Uzi. And yes, that is her username, so I was sort of right about it being a CSGO player with divorced parents. We cut back to Tessa's room. They've all been chained up. Oh, isn't that... Oh, I don't know. Abuse! Tessa is desperate to escape, and the other two robots won't help her as they don't want to suffer the same fate as N. We also finally get a name for this character, Sin. Yes, she is patient zero for the solver and the admin who blocked N solver in episode one. Tessa tries to work out and escape, and Sin says that she will never discard her pets again and she won't have to discard her. She reveals her true form with her many GLaDOS-like eyes. Sin states to stay away from the gala, hinting to the fact that she plans to massacre everyone at the gala. Sin then goes to do some genocide. Tessa and Jay share 
share a terrified expression. And we cut back to N and Crow Uzi. I need to get the Crow Uzi plush right now, man. I swear to God. Uzi explains to N that she's trying to get his memories back from some kind of auto-run program that is trying to delete them, most likely implemented by Sin. After N states that she's like an evil ghost witch, she pecks him and states that she is an evil ghost witch, but then glitches out and the crow dies. And that's what you get for running Windows 10, Uzi. <laughs> Programmer humour. She berates her dad for interrupting her whilst doing important hacking shit, and we can see V and N's bodies on the ground. Khan says she never, she never has friends around, and Uzi retorts by saying it isn't a sleepover, and slams the door in his face. Cutting back to N's memories, we can see red growths all around the room, and some deactivated drone has been strung up, which reminds me a lot of that one scene from Silence of the Lambs. Uzi pretty much pulls N towards the art piece, N moves the deactivated V out of the way of the door, and goes to enter the basement when... Can't Uzi, oh I don't know, just delete the basement door class from the memory file, or is it proprietary? It probably isn't as you can access it using a normal PC. Maybe the robots use C sharp and getting rid of too many semicolons will cause a compiler error. N states that J has the key and there's a spooky audio cue and we see the deactivated V is smiling now. We can also see that she's growing spikes on her hand. This could represent Sin desperately trying to erase the memories as Uzi and N fight back. Cutting back to J going berserk and biting through the chain. She's got some sharp teeth, bloody hell. The two Metal Gear solid their way through the house, intent on killing Sin. In. Tessa almost knocks over a suit of armor and gives the sword it's holding some funny looks. We also see Jay pick up a revolver that's marked It's a Revolver IDK Shut Up Gun Nerds. I consider myself being a gun nerd despite being British and I know that is a 500 Magnum because the M9K weapon pack said so. Both decide to swap weapons for this assault. N tries to warn Tessa and Jay about the fact that V is reactivated and grown wings. The three stand back to back and Uzi retrieves the basement key. The upgraded V clearly has some kind of bloodlust as she attacks. Jay states they've got V and to get to the basement. V lunges for the key. This is clearly Sin trying to to prevent N from unlocking his memories. Jay does her best impression of Raiden from Metal Gear Rising. and fights the possessed V. The two unlock the basement and the solver jump scares them, kills Crow Uzi and attempts to drag N to the basement. I think Sin has given up on the notion of playing fairly now. Luckily, Uzi knows the Microsoft.net framework better than most and manages to take control of the solver. So Jay couldn't kill V and she tries to break into the basement. Uzi sees what's down in the basement and it's corpses of J, V and N. This N and the N we see in the future isn't the first version of N. My theory is that Sin was experimenting on them to make the perfect host for her infection. Coming back to the real world and it turns out Dodder's broken in, looking even more depraved than she already did. Clearly the thing where Sin is losing motor function is clearly happening to her. With Uzi out in simulation, Sin tries to erase his memories again. Cutting back to the gala, we see Sin has made it there in one piece. Tessa and Jay break in, and Tessa's parents aren't mad about their daughter holding a firearm, but about the fact that she's holding it quote, too cool. By the way, that's not how you hold a gun. Sin yeets them out of the way and is about to start monologuing when... Thankfully, Sin cuts this short by turning off the lights and turning the drones to kill mode. The solver states that Tessa didn't have to see this, implying it wasn't part of Sin's plan for Tessa to die. Cutting back to N, we see the solver trying to pick up a scalpel. Dude, you literally have spikes and tentacles for arms. Use those! We cut back to Uzi and Doll fighting over the cockroach, and in a moment of weakness, Uzi gives up her only clue that she has in order to save N. Turns out that whilst this was going down, V can't pick up the damn scalpel either, and the solver is banging its head against the wall. N gives V back her glasses, and she managed to pick up the scalpel perfectly. Her personality seems to come back for a moment, stating that golden retrievers have soft mouths. This angers Sin as... Also, the fact that she says true at the end just made me laugh. I don't know why. Sin decides to try trepanning instead to uninstall N's operating system. We think it's all over when Uzi manages to take back control of the solver and starts lagging to hell. She says that her dad is streaming. Oh, Uzi, you aren't the only one with shit Wi-Fi. I'm pretty sure my Wi-Fi is one step away from a fucking dial-up modem. After recognising and thanking Uzi, V is mad that she is in her head. And they all get forcibly spat out like a C++ programmer trying to find memory leaks. I'm going to keep making programmer jokes. Leave me alone. V is a little pissed about Uzi delving into her memories, but we cut outside to see Doll giving Tessa and Jay the cockroach, referring to it as a key. To make sure that Doll is who she says she is, Tessa fires a bullet at her, and for God's sake, that is not how you hold a gun. Let's hear some wisdom from Solid Snake. You ejected the first bullet by hand, didn't you? I see what you were trying to do, but testing a technique you've only heard about in the middle of battle wasn't very smart. You were asking to have your gun jam on you. Besides, I don't think you're cut out for an automatic in the first place. You tend to twist your elbow to absorb the recoil. 
That's more of a revolver technique. Tessa goes to leave, but she sees Uzi, J, and N, and they all just kind of stare at each other before one frame of them attacking plays and the episode ends. Episode 6 starts off with a desktop background. It's actually a really nice one. Mine's just a screenshot from Metro Exodus. I think I should take a few hints from this. The camera zooms out to reveal an office space. The lights are all killed and we see a girl hiding behind an office cubicle divider. We can see some kind of robot velociraptor claw tap across the ground. Yes, I've seen Jurassic Park one too many times. She attempts to rescue her co-worker but his body is snapped up by two raptors and eaten in front of her. She tries to escape her third velociraptor but he takes a picture for her and she buffers like a first-gen iPhone trying to run YouTube. I don't really know what you want from me for this episode. This is Intro has nothing to do with the rest of the episode. Interesting foreshadowing, I know. So anyway, we cut back to everyone still staring at each other. N approaches Tessa, who is quite happy to see him, but has to stop recreating Don't You Want Me Baby Oh, oh due to the fact that the air is completely toxic. Clearly that helmet isn't doing a very good job of filtering the oxygen, is it? Tessa goes to pet Uzi, but she ends up biting his finger. Let's hope Tessa got a tetanus shot recently, and asks why she's here. She takes the- Real tired of killing this one. <laughs> Effective drones were cloned more. Ah, it is classic you. Ha <laughs> <laughs> yes. Classic Jay. George, George, mate, we're going to do something a little bit bigger this time. After being an arrogant sod, Tessa states they are there because Sin has gone missing on Earth and her last known directive was searching for Uzi, N and V on the human-occupied exoplanets. So both Tessa and Jay decided to lawfully disengage from the company and hopefully find N, V and Uzi before Sin does. Something tells me that Sin isn't feeling very diplomatic. Dol decides that helping these people isn't worth her time or the sacrifice of this cockroach thing, so she uses her kinesis powers to grab the cockroach and book it. And it appears she can also teleport forward like Tracer from Overwatch. Wait a minute, I hate Overwatch. Uh, like Ash from Titanfall 2. There you go, referenced a much better game. The group realise that the key is, you know, pretty damn important and give chase to an abandoned ore refinery. Jay starts firing missiles at Doll, who just uses her blink ability. Yes, I'm calling it that. I don't know what it was called in Titanfall 2, so I'm just going to call it blinking. Anyway, Doll evades Jay's missiles using her blink ability. Tessa tries to shoot her, but we proved in episode 3 that Doll's solar power means that she is impervious to all projectile based weapons. Doll escapes her pursuers by jumping down a massive hole that's a mine that goes down to god knows where. Seeing as Dull has escaped, Tessa decides to divulge Sin's orders, which were to clear the drop zone of all life, construct spires, and find any labs with a skull symbol on them. But that's the same skull symbol that's on Uzi's choker and Dull's pendant. Does this mean that Sin will leave them alone? Is it a marker of some kind? Or are they targets just like the labs? The whole clearing the drop zone thing and constructing spires is what we see in episode 1. Sin has clearly been enacting her master plan all along. Tessa's plan was to find any labs with the symbol on it and burn them down, and the cockroach that Dull stole was their way in. We're probably wondering why. Well, perhaps Dole knew Tessa's plan was to destroy the labs. Dole knows that the only way she can get information on her infection is to use the information she finds in those labs, meaning she needs to get there before Tessa can and retrieve info that will hopefully be able to synthesize a cure. Tessa tells Jay to go mine the ship, probably because she doesn't want her to hear this next part, and Uzi asks why Dole is involved and what's happening to her. Tessa finally confirms what I've been theorizing for the past hour and a half of video length, that the solver is a virus. Dole thinks that they did something to her folks down in the lab, that gave them a hereditary sickness that she inherited. I was completely right. Once a family member is infected with the solver, it's passed to the offspring. Tessa dives into the hole in search of Doll, with no safety equipment. You moron. The four of them land in the hole and survey the area. Uzi using her tail as a light source. Okay, that's pretty dope, I'm not gonna lie. I'd like a tail like that. N asks if the secret elevator will be labelled. N, I love you, mate, but why would the secret elevator be labelled, you lovable, adorable dork. V just rolls her eyes like me when Activision Blizzard fuck up Overwatch 2 even further. We can see that Uzi's tails are chewing on N's hat. Okay, that's just kind of adorable. They continue to search through the area, which wouldn't look out of place in the old aperture levels from Portal 2. As they near an office complex, Tessa kicks a limb, causing it to roll. V pants a light up and we see dozens of murder drone corpses. I count seven corpses, but there's probably a lot more as I'm just counting decapitated heads, and if, if I was counting more than just heads, I'd be here for hours. I mean, just look at this shit. Throughout the scene, we can see graffiti, probably scrawled by the murder drones in their dying moments, saying, don't look into the light. This office building is clearly the building from the opening. Oh, so it did have some relevance. Oh, my statement from the intro aged poorly. Okay, this place has clearly been abandoned for ages, as the dinosaurs murdered all the worker drones along with the murder ones. Someone didn't add a semicolon onto a line of code. Tessa states that there is a security in this place that's, that's specifically dedicated to them. Well, no fucking shit, lad. Does it look like a pizza delivery service? Tessa states that she can control the security measures, but that piece of paper that she's looking at begs to differ. The group continue because they're here for answers about Doll and Dead Mum Origins, so they continue despite Uzi having a lot of depredation. As they journey into the facility, it turns out the secret elevator was marked. This causes V to have a slight mental breakdown. This is all awfully convenient. Tessa steps into a trap and gets dragged off. Uzi and MV give chase, but stumble across a half-dismembered baby in the hallway giggling to itself. N gets freaked out and starts shooting at it, but it sprouts limbs and escapes. Okay, what the 
fuck? The three heroes stand there. Someone deploys a hand and turns it into a prod of some kind. A feral looking worker drone comes down from a vent and deploys an EMP. A bit late to introduce new plot threads now, my pin board's almost full. As Uzi slowly regains consciousness, she looks around the room and it's a control room of some kind. There are TV cameras and a security control point of some kind. Uzi feels like shit because she's got a magnet stuck to head, causing her screen to warp, implying that these screens are CRTs as flat screens don't do that. She sees the person who let off the EMP cutting the head of a body from the intro, letting it fall into a bucket labelled heads. This person with a Texas accent states that she only cuts out the bad parts and leaves the good parts undamaged, but some parts are more valuable from others, she said, gesturing to V. When Uzi brings up the solver, the Texan shows a microwave full of corrupted cores like the one we saw from Jay in episode 2. I can't tell if this throws my theory or backs it up. These things are the solver. The solver is attracted to damaged AI, which explains why Nori had it as she was already kind of kooky before she got infected. When Uzi uses her powers to try and free herself, the Texan states that she's dealt with witches before and looks at the pendant on Uzi's choker, stating that she hasn't seen 002 since she left us to die, 002 being Nori's ID number. This means that Nori was down there at one point or another. Cutting to Tess, she tries to escape. The baby is cutting up N. N's just laughing for some reason. I swear to God, it's almost as unhinged as V. The Texan radios for him to stop as they've got Nori's kid. She says to do something that I can't tell due to the radio distortion, but the robot grabs another magnet and leaves. Tessa uses a knife to escape because she's a badass, and the camera cuts to the Texan about to conduct some kind of surgery on Uzi whilst she's asking about her mother. I assume Uzi was a baby in, in this hologram. She didn't know her mother before she died. The Texan stabs her hand into the bed and cuts off one of her fingers. Honestly, if that was onto a human in a movie, this would be rated 18. God damn it, UK government. Also, can we just agree how brutal this scene is? I mean, the camera cuts away before we see anything, but just seeing V's reaction, if someone as unhinged as her looked away, it must have been bad. Plus, Uzi tries desperately to stop it with her solar powers, but they're balked. God, this scene just made me feel so uncomfortable. The baby goes into the room where Tessa and N were, seeing that they're gone and has a mild freak out and runs back to the Texan. We see Tessa typing on the computer. They agree to rescue Uzi and V. Tessa pulls up an image of the Earth from a satellite and the screen glows with an eerie golden light. What is this? Pulp fiction? N is clearly disturbed what he sees. That isn't the Earth he left behind. Cutting back to the Texan, she looks at N and Tessa on the cameras but can't find them. She sees Uzi's finger grow back and know that she is valuable. The Texan locks the cell doors and opens the doors to set the Raptors into the office to kill Tessa and N. Uzi tries desperately to do something but her visor turns yellow, the solver clearly corrupting her. N looks in horror as he sees what's left of Earth. Earth, disfigured, in pieces, everything just gone. Tessa states that the solver mutates in damaged AI. It took everything and destroyed Earth. Humans travel to the exoplanets to try and observe it, but all they did was spread it in the form of Nori. Tessa states that they must find the lab and the list of infected drones and kill whoever is on it. M must choose the fate of the universe or Uzi, before she mutates into something worse. Enna stops short when a raptor grabs him and yeets him, um, and if you'll excuse me, I'm just gonna go cry. As the Texan watches, Uzi tries further to do something, the solver glitching yellow more and more. Her visor breaks from the stress as she tries to save N. Tessa tries to do an impression of Owen from Jurassic Park, but gets bitten, and we actually see some actual human gore in this thing. The raptor then kills itself because it harmed a human. Hooray for the three laws of robotics, am I right? Tessa gets surrounded by more raptors as the Texan watches in sadistic glee, not noticing that Uzi is messing with gravity. Uzi's visor has gone completely yellow and she speaks like Sin, it's clear that Sin has taken over. She passes a null value into the universe and explodes the controls. I didn't realise the universe ran on C sharp. Before she goes back to normal and fates. The explosion causes the door to unlock and the Texan is murdered horribly and the baby sacrifices itself so V can escape. She managed to evade the raptors but she gets cornered. Her plan was to close her eyes and go guns are blazing but she doesn't need to as the wormhole Uzi created by accident destroys them and the red growths fade into grey ooze. We see V raise her tail and we cut back to M. I love how his screen says your boot looping idiot. What are you, a first gen iPod mini? V crashes through the ceiling and gets angry with Tessa for not being truthful. Uzi wakes up and hugs N. I hope this dream team doesn't die, to be honest. The raptor that killed itself reboots and starts looking for the gang whilst an eerie song plays. It searches through the hall until it comes across Art, saying for it to hold still. V aims at it whilst N is having a mental breakdown. Uzi and N agree to talk after and the anti-drone sentinels walk away. The group jump down and see at the end of a long hallway Doll boot looping and holding the cockroach. The three drones think it's a trap. Uzi attempts to use her solver powers, but N stops her and V gives him the I'm gonna kill you look. Turns out Tessa just went and grabbed it whilst everyone was giving each other the stink eyes. As they walk down the hallway, Uzi and N lock hands and start sweating bullets. V and Tessa see that Uzi and N were holding hands and... 
Oh, these two are so sweet. It's melting my cold, dead heart. Turns out the doll was using a GIF on, on her monitor to simulate boot looping. She grabs the cockroach, activates the lift, opens a door of some kind, and jumps down the elevator sh shaft. The lift following suits, trapping our heroes in. The raptors try to figure out what Tessa is, but the raptor from earlier starts coming towards them, and Tessa's blood isn't having an effect on it this time. Uzi tries to open the elevator using her powers, but her hand glitches out and she opens another wormhole. It's like she's got phantom limb disease, with Sin being able to control her. Sin's trying to do what she did to Earth, but to Copper Nine this time. The raptor picks up a gun and fires at Tessa. V manages to catch the bullet and fire it back at the dino. I mean, she misses completely and holds up her glasses and asks, Uzi is still having a freak out, so N cuts off her hand, and as Uzi falls, Sin sends a message. Miss me. Sin is clearly taking over Uzi the more she uses her powers. This is what Tessa meant when she said mutates into something that isn't herself anymore. As Uzi glitches out, the three of them pile into the elevator. V takes on a raptor. She's in a sword fight with it and manages to get the upper hand before another raptor disables the lift controls. The lift starts heading back up. V decides to cut the lift wires, saying that she trusts Uzi. N begs for her not to do it, but she does. And as the lift cables fray, she salutes and almost looks at peace. And with that, the episode ends. <laughs> So, that's where the series has been left currently. And yes, I am standing up now because I spent five and a half hours writing that script and recording it last night, and quite frankly, I need the exercise. V sacrifices herself to save the rest of the team. Now, this feels like one of those really depressing Souls-like endings, you know, where your character has to fight off endless amounts of everlasting darkness until the end of time. You know, those endings. Thanks, FromSoft. You ruin everything, including your difficulty scaling. It's one of those endings that just makes you shout, Oh, motherfucker, at the screen. And trust me, I did too. Like, this ending is really disappointing. I was actually starting to like V towards the end. It's one of those things where, like, she has a, honestly one of the best character arcs in the series. Like, she actually goes from being this sadistic bitch that you're supposed to hate to actually being kind of selfless, actually. I mean, you wouldn't see episode one V sacrificing herself for Uzi's sake. We know that V trusts Uzi to, well get them out of the situation in one piece. So we've been through a lot in the past hour of video runtime, or thereabouts, I haven't actually... I don't actually know how long this is, because I haven't actually finished editing it together yet. I'm we're working on this in segments. And I know we've been through a lot, so this next section is going to be an outro and clean-up of sorts. I'm just going to kind of clean up the story from my perspective and also give my theories on what the future of the series is going to look like. Because if you're like me, you're probably sitting there staring at your monitor in the murky oubliette that you call a room, and thinking... What the bloody hell did I just witness? And trust me, I was one of them, which is why I made this video, so I can try and better understand this series that I love unconditionally for no good reason. So, I couldn't think of a better transition. JC Jensen in space started experimenting with AI and robots around the mid to late 80s or 90s. We can tell this judging by the VHS tape that we see in episode 5. Using this research, they made worker drones to help mine exoplanets to suck up all the resources for the good of humanity. At some point during this research, the Absolute Solver was created and gave birth to Sin, who slowly started to infect every computer she could get her hands on. Whilst doing this, it was posing as Sin in the Elliot household. This is where it met N, V, and J. Humanity saw that Sin was becoming too dangerous, so sent humans to the exoplanets for safety, not knowing that they sent an infected AI with them that being Nori. The destruction of Copper Nine's core must have happened whilst Earth was still in one piece, prompting the sending of the drones. Whilst they were still heading to Copper Nine, seeing as space is very large, Earth got destroyed, killing any humans on it. Whilst the drones were still travelling to Copper Nine with the Solver, Nori must have been robo-pregnant with Uzi and started having visions of the coming threat, drawing them and going on about the singularity as she slowly went insane due to the Solver infection. When she had Uzi, she started to mutate worse and worse until she mutated into this mess of limbs we see in episode 1. But Khan finished her off, thinking that he killed the infection, when he didn't know that it was hereditary. Uzi grew up as the drones started making attacks, witnessing their atrocities as they built up spires of corpses under the commands of Sin. After Uzi met N, he strayed away from Sin's commands and went rogue in a way, taking V with him. As they started to discover glimpses of their past and what was really going on, Sin started to get more and more aggressive in getting rid of both of their memories, corrupting them slowly and trying to push Uzi and N out. Until, of course, Uzi intervened and got them back. This finally allowed them to have a chance of stopping N using the power of Doll's Key and the help of Tessa, potentially trying to burn the labs down where the Solver was created and killing any worker drones that are still infected. Maybe this way the Solver can be stopped and more planets will not be lost. And that's pretty much all I've got. Listen, I'm like a hamster on Viagra. I'm doing a lot with very little here. Leave me alone, please. I just want to say that, um, 
that uh simile not mine i stole that from zero punctuation i really hope you enjoyed this this was one of my this is my first of a video essay sure i've done kind of review style videos in the past but with the, with the review by a moron series but those don't really go in depth they're more of a first glance kind of reveal i mean most of the games that i reviewed i don't actually complete i just kind of play for four or five hours and then spit out of it a lazy video <laughs> so what do i think is coming next for this series that i've just dedicated two or three I've lost track, weeks of my life to. Well, personally, I don't I don't think V is dead. I know that's kind of a stupid opinion to hold, and my resident Murder Drones fan has called me an idiot for uh, believing this, but I can hope, okay? Plus, I think V was a fan favorite character, and we already know that she's very competent in her combat ability. So I think that, one, she's just too good for a death like that. I mean, sure, she was doing something noble, but I just think her death is just kind of out of nowhere, you know? And I think they wouldn't kill a fan favorite character just off screen like that, that at least if she was going to die for realsies, they would have shown her on screen knowing this series. Yeah, I don't think that, um, I'm 90% sure V will come back. I mean, I know that there's been a report saying that the voice actress for V hasn't actually received any lines or has been told that she's needed for episode 7, but quite frankly, I think that's a ploy. This series was planned for a very long time in advance, I'm pretty sure. And quite frankly, she could return in episode 8. We just don't know, do we, at this point? Because uh, I've got no idea what they're doing over at Glitch Productions, but they're probably smoking something that they probably shouldn't be smoking. Hang on a minute. I think weed's actually legal in Australia. Anyway, moving on. Also, I like to think that what's left of our hero's team will eventually find out the answers to Sin and confront her and end this once and for all. Perhaps even curing Uzi and Doll and N and J of their infection and perhaps maybe fixing the earth that we saw that has been torn into several chunks of rock. Also, I know Uzi will probably make it to the end of the series because there's one, two more episodes planned, and also a second season in production. Again, that's second hand information from my resident murder drone stand, so uh, do not quote me on that because um, I can't be bothered to fact check it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Sin will definitely die by the end of the series, and I really hope that Uzi and N get the happy ending, because quite frankly, I don't want to see this dream team break up. This dream team is called a dream team for a reason. Apart from that, I can't really say much. Uh, I don't know how to end this, to be honest, because, um... We went to the, we went to the end of the series so far, and I suppose we're just waiting until episode 7 and 8 come out. I just, did I really just, I just dedicated three weeks of my life to this, and I, I have no idea how to, I, I feel numb to the whole thing, I've got no idea how to end this. Well, I hope you enjoyed this overly long video that took half my sanity with it into the abyss. Uh, if you did at any point, consider liking and subscribing, as it does really help the channel, and I will probably be shifting to video essay content in the future, as it's the content that I would like to produce. I will probably also still do some gaming content in the form of streams because I really do enjoy doing live streams because it's just like a video but I haven't got to edit it which is fine by me. So uh yeah so if you'll excuse me I'm going to um go and cry over V's death and also go seek help for my mental for my very quickly diminishing mental health um and also actually before I go I'm just gonna one sec um I'm gonna put my phone there it is I'm just gonna quickly uh I've gotta call someone real quick yeah yeah is that um is that uh glitch productions uh, yeah, I've got a bit of an issue. Yeah, your your series downloaded a virus onto my computer. How do I know this? Well, for some reason, every time Jay's on screen, give me more by Britney Spears starts playing.